Some of you uh, uh, have been new to this family in the, in the last month or two, or maybe even today, and uh, we, it, this is a great time to be joining us, because we can now, we're, we're all new to this thing, and uh, we're going to uh, do this together, so that's so awesome. We're beginning a teaching series this morning from uh, the last five chapters of the book of Romans, Romans chapters 12 to 16, which is all about the, the transformed life. Uh, what a life that is transformed by Jesus, transformed in Jesus, looks like. Now, in doing this, we're actually also beginning a new pattern, another step in this journey of merging with Willington Church to become a, a campus. A sat, uh, starting today, we'll be tracking together with Willingdon in, in the Sunday teaching. So as we move forward, the goal will be that for the most part, uh, the Sunday teaching in this campus will track with the teaching at the main campus. One of the questions that always emerges when you talk about the idea of a campus church is, does that mean the preaching is going to be on the screen by video? No. The goal will be to have the majority of the preaching live, uh, not video, although for specific reasons, on very specific occasions, it may be through a video feed. The teachers will be different there and here, uh, but the teaching will be from the same passage. So that's, uh, that's the way we plan on moving forward. And most likely, once we get our own campus pastor, much of the teaching here will be done by this campus pastor. So that's one of the things that I hope you keep praying about and praying for. Uh, from now until uh, the end of June, it will be me when I'm here, uh, and Brian Manukduk, will, our uh, worship and youth pastor, will be preaching several times, and then other Willingdon pastoral staff. So that's, that's from now till the end of June. We'll start our teaching this morning uh, with something that we don't normally do. Uh, we're going to take 30 seconds to talk to each other, if you're comfortable, to just turn to your neighbor, even if it's your partner, and, and give them an example that you can think of, of something that is simple, but not necessarily easy, okay? Simple, but not easy. I think we have the next slide for that. Uh, it, it, it's not complicated, it's pretty straightforward, but that doesn't mean it's not, diffi or it's, it's not difficult. It, it, it could be in your life, or it could be, uh, if you're not comfortable making a personal confession, just something in life in general, something you've observed in other people, okay? 30 seconds, simple but not easy. Talk to, talk to each other. <clears throat> Alrighty, 30 seconds up. Simple but not easy. How many of you said this dumb exercise? <laughs> yeah, somebody's honest. I asked someone this week uh, that, that question, uh, uh, someone, and the immediate response I got was getting out and going for a walk every day. It's not that complicated. But for some reason, it's just not easy, is it? As my engineering friends would say, it's hard to fight entropy. When I asked that, someone that question, she flipped it back on me. And she already knew the answer that I should give, and so I said it. Saying no to opening the freezer and scooping myself a dish of ice cream. Or maybe I should have said saying no to turning down the freezer aisle in the grocery store in the first place, right? <laughs> it's not that complicated. And it makes a whole lot of sense. But it's just not that easy. Now, as you think about it just a bit, the reason a lot of those things are simple but not easy is that they involve a little bit of discipline, mostly mental discipline, which is not something that just sort of comes over me. No matter how much I pray for it, God doesn't give discipline. He doesn't. God gives strength. God gives wisdom. 
God gives some conviction occasionally. <laughs> but discipline is something I have to choose, right? And isn't that what adulting is all about? Making some simple choices. Cleaning up the kitchen before I go to bed. Getting up at the same time every day and starting the day right. Which means remembering what time day actually starts. What time does the day start? When I go to bed. That's when my day really starts, right? So just some, you know, you got, you got the list. All of those basic practices of adulting that are not that complicated, but they're not always easy. As Paul begins this section of the book of Romans on the transformed life in Jesus, he lays out a pattern that is very simple. It's not complicated. For adulting your faith life. A pattern that is the heart of growing up in our faith, the core practice of a transformed life out of which all of this rest of the book of Romans flows. It's not complicated. It's actually very simple. Romans 12, 1 and 2, the basic adulting your faith rhythm. Now some of us are saying, yeah, but didn't Jesus say we should have a childlike faith? Yes, he did. Childlike but not childish. In our childlike faith, we are called to grow up in the faith to think more deeply about simple, basic faith issues. For example, the question that is really underneath and behind our text for today is the question, what, why did Jesus die? Why did Jesus die? One of the faith adulting issues is to think more deeply and to respond more fully to that simple question. I'm not going to ask us to turn to each other and discuss that one, but coming out of the Easter season, I hope it's something we all thought about and pondered a little more deeply this season. Romans 12, 1 and 2 gives us the basic practices of adulting our faith by beginning to think more deeply about responding more appropriately to that question. Why did Jesus die? So think about that as we read Romans 12, 1 and 2 again. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers and sisters, brothers was used to incorporate all of those who are believers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, that it is good and acceptable and perfect. Two ongoing practices, two signs that show I'm serious about adulting my faith. Number one, continually surrendering my body, my body, in quotes, and number two, continually transforming my mind. So let's go a little deeper, talk first about continually and fully surrendering my body. He says, I exhort you, not I suggest, not this is my recommendation, if you want to go further, it's like I urge you, as the NIV says, or I plead with you, as the New Living Translation says. This is your first and basic priority every day. Present, offer up, Give over the right of control of your body. Now, the word body is used in, one of, in, in, in two ways in, in the New Testament. Number one, it's used to talk about our literal physical bodies, okay? And this includes that. But number two, it's also used to talk about my whole self, including my physical body, and that's how Paul uses it here. All of myself, the totality of who I am, everything. Give it all over as a living sacrifice. Now Paul is thinking, as, as we might be imagining, about the altars on which animals were sacrificed, killed as an offering in the Old Testament system. What Paul is saying here is exactly what Jesus taught when he said, Luke chapter 9 and other places as well, if anyone wants to follow me, let them 
deny themselves, not deny themselves things, let them deny themselves and take up their cross daily. That's what it means to follow me, says Jesus. And just to clarify what I'm saying, whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life to me, for me, for my sake, will save it. For what benefit? What does it benefit you if you gain the whole world but lose your life? You know, we often use that term, this is my cross to bear. That's not what Jesus is talking about. The cross Jesus is talking about is not some negative experience in life which I have to endure. The cross was an instrument of death. So let me paraphrase what Jesus and Paul are saying here. Jesus is saying, just like I am dying for you, you need to die to you. In just before his death, Jesus is talking about his death, but then he also applies this to those who follow him. In John chapter 12, he said, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, there's no life that is going to emerge. It can't produce life. That's why we have got fully surrendering, fully dying in the point, in our point. You can't get more fully than dying, Right? Which leads us to that, what I sometimes call the hurdle question. Whether we say it or not, it's the hurdle in our minds that keeps us from doing this. And the question is, why would I even think about doing that? I've got to have some motivation to do something that radical. Well, Paul's anticipated that question, and, and this verse actually answers that question in two very clear and what should be very compelling ways. Number one, present your bodies as a living sacrifice, which means living lives that God calls holy and pleasing to him, not to ourselves, not to the people I want to impress, holy and pleasing to God, which is your spiritual worship. So how does that answer the why question? Well, this, this phrase needs a little bit more explaining, this which is your spiritual worship. It, it's actually not that easy to translate the, the, the nuance of that phrase from the Greek language into the English language. As in, and so several translations have little different tacks on it, but, but, and they're all, they're all right. Uh, the, new, the New International Version says, which is your true and proper worship. What is worship? Offering our bodies as a living sacrifice. That is your true and proper worship. The, the, the New English translation says, which is your reasonable, your logical service. Or as the New American Standard used to say, which is your spiritual service of worship. That one is probably the most accurate, but, but again, that needs a little explaining, right? There are several words in the New Testament translated as worship. One of them, this one, refers to acts, acts of service to God within the worshiping community. Those who help pull off the worship of God's community. So if you're serving communion, that's, that's a, 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 a worship act. And Paul is saying that everyone who is in Jesus can and should worship in this way in everything we do. We should be serving God, doing it as if we were serving God, and doing what serves God. So in this verse, he's simply saying what Jesus said, to appropriately respond to me dying for you, you got to die to you. Sometimes after a Sunday morning service like this, I'll hear somebody say, wow, that was a great worship service. I was really able to worship today. And I usually bite my lips like that, or my tongue. And if they ask me, wasn't it, I'm stuck. Because what I want to say, and sometimes I do, depending on who the person is, I'll say, I don't know. I guess we'll see tomorrow morning. You see, what we do here on a Sunday morning is not really worship. Well, it's not fully worship. It's worship if I use it to inspire me, to encourage me, and to urge me to respond in all of life worship 
on Monday morning by responding appropriately in my daily life in keeping with what Jesus has done for me. That is worship. Now that's one answer to the why question. Because it's a reasonable response to what Jesus did for me. But Paul has already answered the why question in another way. He actually starts this verse with the answer to that why question. Before he gives this command, he tells us why we would do that. Therefore, he said, I urge you, in view of, in light of, with your eyes on the mercy of God, present your bodies. It's the only logical thing to do when I realize how full and rich God's mercy is for me. If you've studied the book of Romans at all, and I know many of you have, you know that that these two verses here, Romans 12, verses 1 and 2, are actually transitional verses in the book of Romans. The first 11 chapters of the book take us on this heavy thinking journey. They include some very poignant, some some potent summary statements, and we're going to see some of them in a few minutes. Uh, They are what we might call the theology of the good news. Beginning at chapter 12, the last section of the book, he talks about how getting a grasp on that theology is going to transform our everyday lives. And in this transition from theology, truth in our heads, to practice, living it out, Paul sums up all of that theology of chapters 1 to 11 in one word. Mercy. The mercy of God. So so let's do just this high-level overview or review of where Paul has taken us in the first 11 chapters. Chapters 1 to 4, what Paul talks about really, the subject of that, is why mercy is necessary. Everyone has, chapter 1, exchanged the truth of God, God being at the center and overall, for a lie. I am at the center. And one of the primary places that shows up, chapter 1, is how we allow ourselves to think about our bodies. It talks primarily about how we deviate from the way God designed our bodies to be a reflection of Him in the area of sexuality. But, but it's not just strictly sexuality. There, there are so many ways we make idols of and we worship our bodies, right? Isn't that one of the primary uses of social media? And the whole summary of of chapters 1 to 4 is probably probably best summarized in in chapter 3, verse 23. All have sinned, and we fall short of the glory of God. That's why mercy is necessary. Chapters 5 to 8, it goes through this heavy-duty, dense theology about how God's mercy is given and how it is made real how it is applied and efficacious. Chapters 5 to 8 talk about how we can be restored to a relationship with God through the sacrificial death of Jesus Christ. What is actually happening behind the scenes in Jesus' death and our response to that. How Jesus in his death has bought us back. A a wonderful summary of that is in chapter 5 verse 8. God demonstrates his own love. He proves his love for us in this. While we were still sinners... Christ died for us. And then in chapters 9 to 11, Paul talks about how we know that mercy is a guarantee. How we know that Jesus' death really is as good for me as it says it is. He talks in these chapters about that great tension in in that, that Paul was experienced that the New Testament church experienced when in transition from the Old Testament to the New Testament to the from the pre-Jesus world to the post-Jesus world, the whole issue of tension between Jews and Gentiles. It's like, what about the Jews in Jesus' death? Does God marginalize some and not others? Are some more important than others? And we encounter terms in, in chapters 9 to 11 like election and predestination which often leads us into this philosophical discussion. But we so easily get bogged down and miss the overall point of these chapters, and that is that God always keeps his promises. God is 
faithful to his promise. He cannot deny himself, as Paul says in, chapter seven, in, in 2 Timothy. Someone I read recently made the point that the central issue in these chapters is God's integrity, his, his faithfulness to his promise. That's how I know that his mercy is real, even for me. It's not about me. It's about a God who is faithful. And so Paul ends the first 11 chapters of the book with a conclusion that God's desire for us, well, as we saw in the book of Jonah a couple months ago, mercy for everyone. He has that great outburst of praise that ends that section. Oh, the depth of the riches and wisdom and the knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments, how inscrutable his ways. What he's not saying here is, oh, it's just mysterious what God does. What he's saying is it's, it's incomprehensible how big the mercy of God is. Only the one true God, only a God who is totally sovereign, who is all-powerful, who is all-wise, and whose power and wisdom and sovereignty is directed by his mercy could come up with this amazing plan. And then he flows right into what we have as chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. Therefore, in view of God's mercy, offer your bodies. Adulting my faith begins with allowing myself to think deeply and personally about the mercy of God. I sometimes say that that being a Christian is giving that part of myself that I know to that part of God that I know. And that's the journey. And when I live in light of the mercy of God, what that helps me to do is to become more aware of and to admit more freely the parts of myself that are still not there. You see, there are two aspects to God's mercy, and it's clear in the book of Romans. Number one, there's there's this relationship relational aspect. His mercy is rooted in his incredible, overwhelming love. Chapter 5, verse 8. God shows his love for us in this, that while we were sinners, Christ died for us. But there's also, not just the relational aspect, there's also the transactional aspect. Some of you don't like that word. It's, It's a bad word these days. But you believe in it. Because when you sell something to somebody and they don't give you money back, you don't like it, right? There is a transactional aspect to it. What did Jesus do in his death? Why did Jesus die? The first answer to that question is Jesus died to make me his. Romans 3.23, all have sinned, fall short of the glory of God and are justified by grace as a free gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Our standing before God as justified, as clean, righteous, came because Jesus redeemed. He bought us back. He paid the purchase price to free me from the dominion of darkness. Yes, he freed me, but not freed me to be independent. He freed me to bring me back where I belong, under him. I I wrote down the the song we sing. I love that. It's where where every, every human heart discovers its native cry in God, which is not, I want to be free to be me. It's, I want to be free to be in him the way I was created 1 Corinthians 6, Paul says, do, do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own. You were bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. That's what he's saying in the first part of Romans 12. So why would I offer and give up control of all of myself? Because number one, it's the only reasonable and logical response to what Jesus did for me. And number two, because he did that in his incredible mercy for us, which is always available for me to be able to come back and do it again. 
You see, one of the core aspects of adulting your faith is to keep on growingly coming to terms with the fact that Jesus died to make me his. I don't belong to myself. I belong to him. Presenting myself to God as a living sacrifice is not a bonus I'm giving God. It's simply growing up, an adulting response to that reality. When LaDonna and I were newly minted empty nesters, we would uh, often have young adults living in our basement for periods of time, a year maybe, one time two years. Several times it was young adults who were struggling a bit in some way with their emotional and mental health and trying to complete university as they were doing that. And we would listen to them and love on them and provide a secure place for them and sometimes help them be accountable. And what, one of these young adults is now a woman in her late 30s, a business professor in a university college in the greater Vancouver area. And being down here, we've reconnected with her. Several weeks ago, she connected with us and said, hey, what are you doing the Easter weekend? It's like, hey, I'm a pastor. <laughs> Easter weekend's booked. But she had access to a cabin on Bowen Island for a few days. And she wanted to host us there. And so last Sunday after church, we zipped out to spend two days with her. It was <laughs> incredible. It was, it was a cabin on a bluff overlooking the bay. It's a great place to relax, study a bit for today. It's actually cool to think about the little life joys God gives us as we give ourselves to, to him. As we were planning for our time there, LaDonna asked her, hey, I'll, I'll be glad to bring suppers. What would you like? And she said, are you kidding? Did you ever count the number of suppy, suppers you made for me? Cooking meals is the least I could do for you. And so Sunday night, we arrived to a full roast beef dinner, Yorkshire puddings included. That was cool. She talked about how when she was living with us, she knew nothing about cooking. And she talked about the first lesson that LaDonna tried to beat into her head. The first lesson for cooking is keep your toes pointed at the stove. You don't leave the stove. <laughs> Everything starts burning. It cost us a lot, that Anyway, she was simply responding to us in kind to what we did for her. Now that's adulting, right? Presenting your, living, your bodies as a living sacrifice, it's simple. It's not complicated, but it's not easy. Are you wrestling well with that? What are you wrestling with right now? Are you trying to make it complicated with all kinds of reasons why it's okay in your situation? In what way might it be time for you to say, okay, Jesus, I will give in. I will surrender into your incredible love by dying even to this. It's not easy. But it can become more natural over time, and that's what verse 2 is all about. How can I come to the point of seeing it as the logical, the reasonable thing to do? How can I get into that rhythm well? Present your bodies, and verse 2, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. In order to see continually presenting my body, all of me, to all of God, as something reasonable and logical, I need to continually upgrade my mental operating system. That's what Paul is saying here. The gospel is not just information I need to accept and a transaction I need to, to do. It's information that must lead to transformation, first of all, in the way I think. The transformed life is rooted in a renewed mind. That's his point here. Let me put that even more bluntly. I will only have a transformed life to the extent that I have a renewed mind. There are several things we need to see about what Paul says about a renewed mind. Number one, who is responsible for me having a renewed mind? Look at what he says. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Who is responsible? It's me, right? 
He doesn't say pray that God will speak his thoughts into your mind. He says be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Not Lord change my thoughts, it's Lord I will change my thinking. It's not Lord put new thoughts into my head, it's I will choose to start thinking in line with the truth that is in Jesus. That's that's how Paul puts it in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 21. Adulting your faith means owning your thinking, the way you think, what I allow myself to think, and choosing to think in line with the truth that is in Jesus, which is the gospel. It's not enough to say, well, I can't help the way I feel. No, you can't necessarily help the way we naturally feel but you can choose how much you, your, your feelings dictate your thinking. I need to own what I think. And more importantly, what he's talking about here, I need to own how I think. Eventually, how I think will influence how I feel, but immediately it will help me not respond based on how I feel. I was engaged some time ago with someone who was confronted about something he had done that clearly violated the truth that is in Jesus. His response was, well, I prayed for God to test my heart and he didn't reveal anything to me that was wrong with my heart. Hmm. I didn't say anything, but I felt like saying, well, you actually didn't need to pray about it. Because Jesus said, what comes out of your mouth reveals what's in your heart. Whether he recognized it or not, this man was justifying the way he thought about something and the way he acted in response to that thought by what he felt about something. He did not respond out of a mind that was continuing to be renewed. I talked about a third person in that. How often is that me? What does Paul mean when he talks about renewing the mind? It's not just about the thoughts that we think. It's about the way of thinking that makes us think those thoughts. I love the way Tim Keller puts it. It means the governing influence of my mind must be reoriented. Our thoughts, to a large degree, are determined and directed by the governing influence in my mind. The ideas that we allow ourselves to believe or just assume are true. The operating system behind our thoughts. Here's how Paul puts it in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 23. And in verse 21, he referred to the truth that is in Jesus. In verse 23, he says that we are to be renewed, transformed. We are to be made new, renovated. Where first? In the spirit of our minds. The spirit is, is sort of the, the orientation of our minds. The inner processing system which directs what and how I think about everything, including myself. And if I'm going to be able to consistently surrender all of myself to all of God, this operating system needs an overhaul. And once again, who does this overhaul? Is it God? No, it's me. I need to consciously and consistently make sure my thinking is being directed guided by a new operating system. So why does my operating system need to be transformed? Well, again, he's already told us. It's because, naturally, my operating system is formed by, it's conformed to this world's way of thinking. Literally, it says, do not be conformed to this age. The mindset the thinking patterns of this age. You see, it's so natural to buy into the thinking that, that the Bible comes from a different age, a different time. It's no longer relevant today. Actually, from the very first page, <laughs> the Bible has always confronted the spirit of the age. Right from the first chapter, the creation account in the Bible was written to counter the spirit, the thinking patterns of that age about how this world came to be and what the world is for. Someone has said that every age has its own thoughts, ideas, and value that influence the culture, the spirit of the age. It's the kind of growing consensus 
that morally lulls us to sleep, gradually causing us to accept society's latest values. So, what is the spirit of this age? We could spend a lot of time on that one. I, I would encourage you to think about this more deeply than we sometimes do. I've, I've been very helped by uh, several books, but one more accessible one by Carl Truman called Strange New World. How, how we came to the point of the way we think about ourselves today. It's a, it's a wonderful, wonderful read. Carl Truman, Strange New World. But what is the most fundamental basic thinking pattern of our age? It comes down to you be you, follow your heart, and what is your heart? It's what you feel. Be true to yourself. And when we come to the Bible with that way of thinking, what do we do? We look for and we interpret what we read in a way that validates our thinking and feelings which are conformed to this world. We interpret what we read through our own lens. Remember how we put it when we were looking through the story of Jonah? Jonah's mindset facing God is what we call the logic of stuck. Jonah had a very clear assignment from God. And Jonah said no. Because his logic was, God wants what's best for me. I know what's best for me. And therefore, what I want for me must be what God should want for me. Right? Isn't that the way we think? Oh, yeah, I believe God wants what's best for me. But I'm the one who knows what's best for me. Therefore, what I want for me, God will want for me. That's how we allow ourselves to think. And who's at the center of that thinking? It's me, not God. And that's the number one way we need to allow our thinking to be renewed. Start with God. Who he is, what he made creation to be, especially humanity, a reflection of him, directed by him, ruling this world under him and for him, not for me. Unless we come to terms with the ways that we are conformed to this world, even though we don't realize it, even though we know there are some things about us that, yeah, we probably should change, unless we identify those ways in which we are conformed to this world, what will tend to happen is we will just settle. Or in medical terminology, like my wife sometimes likes to use, we will settle for living with a low-grade spiritual infection. No energy. We don't know why. We just can't do it. And we say things like, oh, it is what it is. That's just the way I am. Nobody's perfect. God understands. Folks, whenever you hear or start saying some of those lines, when you catch yourself starting to think along those lines, especially that one, oh, well, nobody's perfect, God understands line, we need to allow that to become a signal in our minds. Red flag, red flag. That thinking, that statement comes from a mind that is not being renewed. I'm allowing it to conform to the, this age. Let's just think a little bit more about some of those. You be you, be true to yourself, follow your heart. Do, do you know why those are so fundamentally contrary to a transformed mind? Well, it relates to the other answer to that question that, that this verse is speaking into as to why Jesus died. The one answer is that Jesus died to make us his. That's why dying to myself is simply logical. But the second answer to that question, and it's the key to this second part of adulting your faith, is that Jesus died to make me like him. He died to make me whole, the way I was created to be in the image of God. In Romans chapter 6, Paul said, if we're united with him in his death, we will also be united with him like him in his resurrection life. It's one of the big themes in Paul's letters when it comes to this idea of life transformation. Colossians 3, 
We've seen Ephesians chapter 4. Colossians 3, verse 10. You put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge in the image of its creator. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18. We all with unveiled faces beholding the glory of God are being transformed into that same image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. We are beholding the glory of the Lord, not thinking about the spirit of this age and conform to this spirit. So what is it that's shaping and forming the thoughts you have? Are you thinking that because feelings are real, which they are, are you thinking that because feelings are real, they are your reality? Are you simply allowing your thinking to be shaped by what comes at you every day by the spirit of this age? As you think about what about your life needs changing and how you want that change to happen, have you done any thinking about what it is that's shaping the thoughts and the perspectives you have on your life? We celebrate today the place where transformed life begins. Always. Always it begins right here. And Jesus invites us, he invites all of us to come to his table. It's not our table. This is his table. He comes here to celebrate this regularly. Why? Well, basically to make sure that we're continuing to adult our faith. To give ourselves to growing in our response to his life-transforming death, his mercy. We're going to stand together. We're going to sing. And as we sing, would you ask yourself, is there any way this, the mercy of God in Jesus, in his death, is there any way this is inviting me to adult my faith. Anything I need to lay down about myself, let die on the altar of Jesus' sacrifice so that I can experience his life more fully. Is there any way I need to say to Jesus in a new way, no, you own me, not me. I'm going to obey you, not my own heart. Is there any way if you're justifying that line, well, that's just the way I am. My feelings are me. But today you need to hear Jesus inviting you to say, no, I want to be more like you. As Paul says in Philippians 3, I become like him in his resurrection as I become like him in his death. If you can say yes to that journey today, in any way, Jesus invites you to participate and take this so as we sing, we would invite you to come forward and receive. And if you're in a balcony, it will be served to you. The elements that represent his death for you, his body and his blood. Return to your seat and hold the elements and then reflect on this, these questions as we sing together.